I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, I think that the IIEA is a, uh, not only a really good organization for um, forcing people to think in a slightly broader way than we often do, uh, but I also think it's a hugely relevant um, uh, organization. Uh, and I think the, the agenda that has been set for today and the theme of the conference today uh, is one that is uh, an extraordinarily important one for Ireland, uh, as well as um, uh, global populations and European populations outside of Ireland. Um, my job um, is to uh, respond in terms of <clears throat> how this country uh, plans to take forward what in, I regard as our most important industry, uh, not only indigenous industry, but, um, but industry as a whole, which is the agri-food sector, uh, which involves primary producers, i.e. farmers and fishermen, uh, but also involves processors, food companies, marketing people, agencies like Bordbia, uh, uh, and so on. Um, many of you will have heard me speaking uh, over the last number of months uh, about the context um, under which the Common Agricultural Policy Review is being debated this time round. I think a, a number of things have changed fundamentally in the food debate uh, in the European Union. Uh, and I think that over the last six months in particular, uh, there has been a realization uh, amongst many people who um, in the past had, had taken a very simplistic approach towards how we feed the European population, which was based on uh, importing cheap food imports to try and uh, provide food as competitively and as cheaply as possible for our consumers. I think the debate has become a much more sophisticated one now. Uh, the issue of food security is now center stage. Um, and the importance of Europe producing not only its own food, um, but also the contribution that the European Union has to make in feeding the world in a much broader sense. And I think the common agricultural policy in the past has been about protectionism. It's been about creating an artificial market for food production in the European Union that limited supply in order to drive demand, in order to keep an artificially high price for food, uh, which by the way was necessary because we were asking our primary food producers to produce food uh, uh, under conditions that were not being applied in other parts of the world, and therefore it was more expensive to produce a litre of milk or a tonne of grain uh, or a tonne of beef in the European Union than it was in other parts of the world, and we needed to compensate farmers for that, and rightly so. And so, as European consumers demanded and, Europe, and the European political system demanded high standards around issues like traceability, animal husbandry, disease control, and all of the other things that have been a really good thing for developing a standard and a brand and a promise around Irish food of quality and consistency of supply, um, um, that had a price tag. And that's what the common agricultural policy was about in the past as to how we would manage that artificial uh, pricing and support of food production in the European Union to keep our farmers intact, to keep rural communities alive, uh, but also to recognize the fact that food production in the European Union was different to other parts of the world. Uh, and the debate is still around how we keep that quality intact, but it's also seeking a new dimension now which is how do we increase volumes also? And how do we increase volumes under the kind of new and extraordinary pressures that we now know about uh, that make it more difficult to do that? Uh, climate change um, um, being probably at the center of that, but not just climate change, there are other issues also that I want to refer to here. So the context for this is, is actually a very simple one to understand. The demand for food is growing and will continue to, 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 to grow at an extraordinary rate year on year. And the question is, how do we meet that global demand for food? Back in, and people will have heard me say this before, but back in 1960, there were three billion people on this planet. By 1990, that, that number had doubled to six billion people. We're now just under seven billion people. 
by 2050, the figure will be 9 billion people. And not only that, but the population of the world uh, uh, in itself, apart from the growing number, is actually moving into towns and cities. So it's urbanizing. And with that, uh, people are becoming uh, um, what have been you know, rural dwellers, uh, often uh, relying on, on a pretty simple diet uh, around carbohydrates, are now moving into towns and cities. They are becoming middle class people who are demanding more choice, more options, and a better diet around protein. Uh, and as has been referred to by uh, the previous speakers, that creates an extraordinary both obligation and opportunity for countries like Ireland that has the capacity to produce more food at a consistently high quality uh, um, to actually meet that demand. But I think that uh, there are a number of things that need to be recognized if we're going to be allowed to do that. Um, first of all, and this may be slightly controversial for, for some of you, uh, in my view, um, the European Union uh, is giving fantastic leadership on the climate change debate in most areas. But when it comes to the complex relationship between food production and climate change, in my view, EU policy is all wrong. Um, we have taken a fairly simplistic approach towards um, um, setting climate change targets uh, for uh, the European Union by breaking it up uh, uh, into uh, targets for each country. Uh, and Ireland has signed up and has a legal obligation to meet the targets that we've signed up to, uh, which is, a, in rough terms, a 20% reduction in emissions by 2020 um, outside of the ETS sector. Um, but, but outside of the traded sector, agriculture makes up more than 45% of our emissions. Uh, so on the one hand, we have this extraordinary demand on countries like Ireland to actually increase food production. Uh, and at the same time, we are saying that 40% of, of our emissions problem comes from an area uh, um, where we're going to be seeking potentially significant reductions in terms of emissions. And so there is this assumption made that if, that, that, that if somehow Ireland reduces its agricultural output in order to meet climate change targets, that we're somehow doing something positive for the climate change uh, 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 targets that are being set globally. Uh, when in fact, what we're simply doing is um, moving food production out of a country like Ireland to somewhere else in the world. We're outsourcing the problem, which makes European figures look good in terms of emission targets, but is doing little or nothing. In fact, in my view, has a negative contribution to make towards global emissions. So this isn't the same as transport or home heating or some other sector that has um, uh, um, a, a climate change challenge also. If you switch your car from a, a petrol or diesel driven engine to, a, to an electric engine, you are doing something positive to actually reduce the emissions going into the global atmosphere. If you're a farmer that's forced to, re to reduce your herd size so that Ireland can meet its emissions targets, you will simply transfer that um, uh, meat production to somewhere else in the world, more than likely outside of the European Union. Uh, and so we will look good in terms of our figures from a climate change point of view, but the global um, uh, emissions uh, simply get transferred from one country to another. Uh, and in many cases, from an Irish perspective, gets transferred to a country that is less efficient from an emissions point of view. So I think we need to create a much more sophisticated and honest debate around the relationship between food production and our obligation as a European Union to increase food output as well as keep um, price consistency and quality consistency of food production in the European Union um, and uh, take a responsible approach towards climate change. Now that being said, we can do a lot to reduce the emissions from, uh, uh, from food production. And we, are, we have an obligation to do that. And R&D and science will put Ireland at the forefront uh, of that challenge. And I met this week with the um, uh, New Zealand Minister for Agriculture. Uh, and he um, reflects an awful lot of my views in this area. Uh, and they are doing a lot of interesting research at the moment. In, in essence, how you breed um, uh, into cattle uh, a reduction in, uh, 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 in methane release essentially from the front and back end, to be overly specific about it. Uh, um, and, and they are getting some really interesting results from that. So, so, so we can do a lot 
to actually play our part in reducing emissions from, um, uh, uh, from the food sector. But, but, but the, the first driver here, in my view, has to be uh, our responsibility as a European Union and as a country towards contributing to actually feeding the world, who will need 70% more food in volume terms between now and 2050. And that is the awesome opportunity that this exporting country has um, in terms of food markets and in terms of expansion. Um, so what are we doing about that? Um, there's two things really. First of all, uh, um, we are lobbying hard to actually create a new debate in terms of the, the common agricultural policy uh, agenda. Uh, and it is more than likely uh, that Ireland will hold the EU presidency for the first half of uh, 2013 uh, when the Common Agricultural Policy Review is finalised. Uh, and that puts us, puts us in a very influential position in terms of the context and the direction and the, uh, and the end result that, uh, uh, that we get from CAP. Uh, and I think the, the start of the real CAP debate began last week. Uh, when we got an idea as to what the opening position from the European Commission is in terms of um, the, the starting point uh, as regards the percentage of, of EU budget uh, going towards the, the common agricultural policy and the, the food and agriculture agenda. And I think that that is a reasonable starting point from an Irish perspective. Uh, it is maintaining uh, the levels of support that are there in actual terms um, uh, into the future. Uh, and I think that that is, is a reasonable starting point considering where the political debate was six and eight months ago when there were a lot of people lobbying hard for a dramatic reduction uh, in supports for um, primary, uh, primary food, uh, food production. So we've come a long way and I think over the next 18 months we will continue to travel uh, a further distance to actually reinforce this message that food, food production, food security uh, um, uh, is something that needs uh, uh, support um, uh, and encouragement uh, within the European Union uh, rather than anything else. From an Irish perspective, um, we have, in my view, um, a fantastic document uh, and a set of targets uh, that the industry and farmers and government uh, are all working to. Uh, it's called Food Harvest 2020. Many of you will be very familiar with its detail. But essentially, this came about by stakeholders in the industry uh, writing a document that is ambitious but realistic in terms of growing the food industry in Ireland and its contribution to the Irish economy over the next 10 years. Uh, and there is significant government buy-in to that. And it's one of the really good things that the last government did. Uh, they, they facilitated the setting of um, not only targets but also a roadmap to get us to those targets. Uh, and it's my job now to, uh, to pick up that baton, uh, to set targets on a quarterly basis for the implementation group around Food Harvest 2020, uh, and to continue to drive that agenda uh, amongst all of the players in the food sector, um, not just one element of, the, uh, um, of them. Uh, and that, uh, that project uh, is, uh, is about to get its, its uh, first year uh, scorecard written. Um, uh, next week uh, or uh, early the week after uh, and I think that um, people should be uh, quite excited by the results of that. We have already upgraded uh, the targets uh, as regards beef um, and just to give you a, a flavour, what we're talking about here is increasing food production in Ireland by 33% in, vo in volume terms, that's a third by 2020 and in value terms uh, increasing the value of Irish food by 40%. And they are very realistic targets. In the beef sector, uh, the targets within Food Harvest 2020 was for a 20% increase in the output value coming from the beef sector by 2020. We've already achieved a 10% increase in output value of beef in Ireland because of the increase of uh, um, beef prices uh, over the last 18 months. Uh, and so we've upgraded that target now to a 40% uh, value output uh, increase by, by 2020. And we will look at the other targets as well and change as appropriate. Um, but the, the underlying story here is one of opportunity for an industry that, that already has uh, really deep foundations in place for expansion and growth. Um, over the last 
three to four decades, the Irish food industry has grown, it has built stone upon stone, if you like, in, in a very solid way. And we have an extraordinary platform and infrastructure now upon which to lean to actually build a, a really ambitious program of expansion and growth, seeking out new markets both within the European Union and further afield, um, uh, in a way that, uh, in my view, can offer fantastic growth and jobs potential uh, and become the big good news story for the Irish economy. I mean, 60% of output from indigenous countries in Ireland, or companies in Ireland, comes from the food sector. Um, last year, we saw an 11% growth in food exports out of Ireland, up to uh, almost 8 billion euros. Um, by 2020, we want that figure to be 12 billion. To put it really simply, Ireland as an island of 6 million people produces enough food for 36 million people. By 2020, we want that figure to be 50 million people. And when you consider that world population is growing by a million and a half a week at the moment, you begin to realize that actually the contribution that we want to make towards feeding the world's population is actually a very modest one even if we meet all of our targets in Food Harvest 2020. And so the next question you have to ask yourself is, well, what segment of the market are we actually targeting as a country? Because Ireland, even though we are increasing volumes, we're not really in the volume business. We're not like countries like you know, Brazil and, and other countries that have extraordinary um, uh, volume potential in terms of output. Ireland is a little bit different. We do need to increase volumes, but we also need to insist on maintaining and improving the, the, the Irish brand around quality uh, and consistency and safety of Irish food. And that, in my view, will allow us not only to increase the, the amount that we're exporting, but also to, to target a premium sector that can, com can, that can command a premium price. And I'm talking about products like baby infant formula, that mothers will pay more for because they see an Irish brand on the carton, because they associate it with safety. And so price isn't the main driver when you're talking about feeding an infant. 16% of, uh, um, uh, of all infant formula consumed in the globe at the moment is produced in Ireland. 16%. One in every six or seven babies that are drinking from a bottle as we speak, are drinking an Irish product. Because consumers want that product because they associate it with quality and consistency, something that they can rely on. If you look at a, um, at, uh, at a market like China that has a 20% growth rate in demand for infant formula year on year at the moment, there is extraordinary potential for Ireland to expand into that market because of the brand that we have there. At the moment, New Zealand are taking advantage of that. But Irish product is in equal demand, but it's just not in equal supply. And as a result of that, and responding to it, we see you know, a very significant uh, a building project to, to increase uh, infant formula just outside of McCroom, uh, as we speak. Uh, at the moment, Danone uh, in McCroom produced 35,000 tons of infant formula each year. Within the next 18 months, that'll be over 100,000 tons a year. That's good business. It's good opportunity for dairy farmers. It's more opportunity for milk processors. It's more competition for raw product for milk, which will potentially drive up the, um, the price, uh, which is good from a dairy farmer point of view, but is, um, is a challenge in terms of the competitiveness um, um, of the price of milk um, for the industry uh, as a whole. But you don't have to look as far as China for uh, demand uh, um, growth for food. If you look at our beef industry, uh, which represents our biggest exports in terms of volume uh, and in terms of value, uh, within the European Union, the biggest importer of beef in the European Union is Germany. They import 400,000 tons of beef a year. Ireland is the biggest exporter of beef in the European Union. Last year, we only exported 7,000 tons to Germany of their 400,000 tons imported. This year, we're hoping that that figure will nearly double. 
Uh, and there's a reason why that figure is so low. It's a hangover from BSE 12 years ago. Uh, um, and we are coming out of that shadow now. In fact, we are out of that shadow and in the sunshine in terms of the reputation around um, the quality and safety of Irish beef now. And we will take advantage of that. Last week, um, I was in London uh, meeting uh, some Irish food companies there, some buyers there, uh, and some of the agencies working to market uh, Irish food in, in London. Um, last year, we exported 3.6 billion euros of food to the UK. We imported 2.7 billion euros of food. We have this extraordinary trade relationship around food with the United Kingdom that, in my view, can be built on and grown. Uh, uh, this is our closest, but also by far our most important and biggest market. So the, the, the issues here are not about will there be demand for the product. There is extraordinary demand for what we produce, both within the European Union and outside it. The demand is almost infinite in countries like India and China and Indonesia and so on, as their populations grow, as their middle class populations grow, um, uh, and as, as they demand the kind of dietary lifestyle that we have come accustomed to. They want what we produce, and they will pay for it. And they will pay a premium for it if they think that they are buying a premium product. And that is the market that we must target. As farmers, as processors, as big food companies that are actually carving out those markets for themselves and taking advantage of them. We must instill in every farmer in Ireland that they are producing something for a consumer somewhere else in the world, not producing a raw product for a processor down the road. So that we instill in everybody this um, uh, mentality of Ireland being the best at what we do in the food sector. And that will contribute to building the brand in a positive way that we rely on to actually forge new opportunities in new markets. Let's be clear on this. 80% of everything we produce in this country, from a food point of view, needs to find a home outside of Ireland. And we need to persuade somebody to pay for it. That means that the brand that, that surrounds our food products is something that we must, must protect at all costs, which means that my department and the agencies that work with us must enforce and encourage standards all of the time. Uh, and so that is at times inconvenient in terms of uh, uh, the bureaucracy involved, the form filling involved, the inspections involved, and, and so on. But there is a purpose behind all of that. And the purpose is exploiting the opportunities for selling premium product at a premium price in other parts of the world that attach something just a little bit special to what we produce from Ireland. And that's happening. Uh, and that's why Kerry Group have grown the way they have. Uh, that's why other Irish food companies are continuing to grow and expand the way they have. Uh, and indeed in the, in the drinks sector, uh, uh, where the, the reputation is, is around something a little bit different, but it's also around quality. They are expanding the way they are expanding also. And people don't talk about drink very often, but I mean, if you look at the whiskey market at the moment, the fastest growing whiskey brand in the, Europe, in, in the world at the moment is Jemison. They have double digit growth in 36 different countries as we speak. Um, that is the kind of potential that Irish food products and Irish drinks products have if we put the right branding around them and if we give, give them uh, the, the necessary supports uh, to actually make that happen. And Food Harvest 2020 is our template for that development. And Pathways for Growth uh, is the actual business plan to get us there. And we have politicians, academics, business people, farmers, uh, uh, and every other stakeholder in the food sector involved in that journey with us. And so we're all, as Irish people would say, pulling in the one direction. Uh, and that is why agriculture and agri-food is going to be, and, uh, and is already, a good news story for the Irish economy, even in the midst of recession. That is why it's growing, it's employing more people, it's creating more wealth than at any stage in the past. Irish exports last year were higher in value terms and value terms than at any time during the boom years. Uh, and, and so we, we need to 
ensure that, it, that, that we do everything we can to exploit the, the sustainable potential of food production in Ireland. And I have a challenge in, in terms of the political challenge around CAP and climate change targets and a whole series of other things. You have a challenge also as stakeholders in the food sector to meet the targets that are being set for you in Food Harvest 2020, whether you're a processor or a farmer. And we need to work together in partnership to make um, uh, the growth potential of the food sector a reality year on year and not just allow a report that has targets set for 2020 to sit on the, sh uh, uh, the shelf until then. Uh, so I look forward to that journey and that challenge with you. I am absolutely committed to it. I intend on being a champion for the agri-food sector as long as I'm in this job. Uh, and I hope that you will send your comments, your criticisms, your solutions uh, to remove barriers to, to progress uh, um, uh, as and when they develop. Uh, because I obviously, uh, and this government, and this is a theme coming straight from the Taoiseach, uh, we want to hear from people that have solutions. Um, so that we can implement them, uh, or at least look at the option of implementing them, uh, to try and release the potential that is there in so many sectors of the Irish economy that's being frustrated at the moment. But from my perspective, it's the agri-food sector. And we are pressing ahead in a very exciting and ambitious way. Uh, and I hope that that journey will continue, uh, because I think the Irish economy needs good news stories like the one that we're providing at the moment. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening.